When it comes to characters like Sanji and Wu, there are many interesting things that make him one of the strongest mainstream manga characters today. Whether it be his impressive strength, necromancer abilities that come from his power as the Shadow Monarch, or his undeniable speed, all these things come in combination to make Sanji and Wu one of the most dangerous mainstream manga characters you'll read about. But first off, who is Sanji and Wu? In a world filled with portals to dangerous realms of monsters and magic, only the bravest hunters can survive, and among them is a young man who rose from the ranks of the lowest level hunters and become one of the most powerful beings in the world. A story that is one of determination, strength, and a thirst for knowledge. Sanji and Wu's journey began when he was a low-level hunter struggling to make ends meet, but everything changed when he discovered a hidden dungeon and faced a very powerful demon barely surviving the encounter. From that day on, Sanjin Wu gained the abilities to level up and become an unstoppable force. With each quest he completes, he becomes stronger and stronger, and every monster he defeats, he becomes stronger and stronger. And as his strength becomes greater, his determination to discover the secrets of the portals becomes even heavier. Now before we dive into the powers of Sanjin Wu, let's actually explain the beginning. At the dawn of time, there only existed two things, light and darkness, until the absolute being turned light into something we know as the rulers and darkness into the monarch. To explain simply, the rulers were pretty much angel-like figures that represented God and worship. They protected all the plants and all the living things to make sure they could thrive and exist, and worshipped the absolute being as if he were God itself. The monarchs, on the other hand, worshipped destruction. They wanted the destruction of all life and the destruction of the rulers themselves. This eventually led to a war that lasted eons between the monarchs, the rulers, and all their servants. This war went on for so long and was so painful and brutal that eventually a ruler questioned the absolute being. They asked God, how could you not help your soldiers? How could you not help the rulers and life themselves defeat the monarchs? This, of course, was until the the rulers eventually took notice that God actually enjoyed the battle. God took joy seeing these lower beings fight for their existence. In their eyes, the absolute being looked at the war as a type of game to him, something that he could enjoy like a TV show. The rulers eventually realized that as long as the absolute being existed, the war would never end. So rulers turned, killing the absolute being and killing all remnants of its existence. But one ruler disagreed with this. This ruler turned on the rest of the rulers and fought for his God, fought against them and fought hard. And at the end of the battle, this ruler was granted a wish, a gift, a gift from God itself that would result in his power to control the dead itself. This would be later referred to as the power of a necromancer. With this new power in hand, the ruler struck a deal with the monarchs to become the new monarch of shadow and a new alliance emerged. And that's the true backstory to the monarch of shadows. The reason why this is so important is because the monarch of shadows power is what's given to Sun Jin Wu and is the reason he becomes so strong. But there was one major problem. No one on earth could handle the monarch of shadows power. But this is where the system comes in. Basically, the architect works with the monarch of shadows to make a system that a human could eventually build up the power to handle the monarch's power. So that if a human gets the power of the shadow monarch, he would have to build up and gain levels to eventually be able to use the full capabilities. And so by then, his body would adapt. So when Sanjin Wu was handed the power of the system by the architect at the start of the series, the goal was so Sanjin Wu could eventually wield the full power of the Monarch of Shadows. Which what brings us to the next part of this video, how strong is that power? One of the most notable parts of this power is the ability to use necromancy. The ability of a necromancer basically gives him the power to resurrect anyone he kills within reason. With this, he's able to train them and make them even stronger, and on top of that, he's able to use the abilities they possessed when they were alive. A good example of this being done in practice is when he takes Tusk. Tusk was originally a Red High Orc and the leader of them. And once Sun Jin Wu defeated him, he took over his body, resurrected him, and then had all the powers of all his him. This includes the ability to make people go mad, the ability to make people go blind, a protection spell that works as a barrier, and on top of that, some other stuff. Like the Hymn of the Giants, for example, which gives him the ability to basically make his whole team around him stronger. Or another character we could use is a character like Biru, who was originally the strongest ant within the Jeju Island raid, who went on to be able to actually hurt a monarch. The reason why this is so insane is because Jeju Island was back in the chapter 100 range. While we see Sun Jin Wu having trouble against monarchs in chapter 160, when he far surpassed the original Biru. Which is why Sanjin Wu is so insane. Sanjin Wu has the ability to kill someone, resurrect them, and make them stronger than they were before. But do you know what's even more insane? The fact that he can summon more than one. Now when it comes to talking about how many shadows he can summon at once, it's very important we make this distinction. In the first season, he's able to summon over 127. And then this extends all the way to a couple hundred in the second season. And then by the end of the second season, we know he's able to summon 100,000 plus. This is all due to the combination of him getting a massive amount of mana when defeating the Architect. And then on top of that, he inherits the whole original army of the original Monarch of Shadows. Which includes multiple dragons that are stated by Thomas Andre to be at the level of wiping out all of human existence. So that leads us to one of the biggest questions of this video, how strong is Sun Jin Wu in his shadows? First things first, one of the most impressive feats we can bring up for Sun Jin Wu in his shadows in Season 1 happens to be Tusk's feat with the Orb of Avarice. Now we explain it pretty simple, the Orb of Avarice has the ability to boost a fire user's abilities even stronger. And to make it pretty simple, Sun Jin Wu gives this orb to Tusk his shadow so he can boost his firepower while they're going up the 100 level tower. And funnily enough, this is where we actually see the feat take place. Within the feat itself, we see Tusk vaporize a bunch of buildings across a whole City line. And the reason why this is so impressive is because he basically released a beam with the ability to vaporize rock and concrete. And the reason why this is so important is because vaporizing and turning something into vapors is way more impressive than just destroying something or breaking it in half. And to be more specific, fragmenting rock takes around 8 joules per cubic centimeter, while vaporizing takes around 25,000 joules per cubic centimeter. And from here, we're actually able to figure out how strong this feed is. First things first, we need to figure out how wide Tusk is. To do this, I basically had to figure out the higher your average building floor and then gain the 2.7 meters, which it is, and then using that to get around 157.2 meters for the width of Tusk. And just with that, I was able to get the width 
and the length of the blast. And then with that, I'm basically able to get the volume of it using a cylinder formula. And then with that, I'm able to get the jewelage through vaporization of rock. Now, with all that in thought, I was able to get around two gigatons of TNT. And to put that into perspective, that's over 550,000 times the energy of the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Which is approximately enough energy to destroy a large mountain or a small island. Now, the reason this is so important is because we know Baron the Demon King at the top of the tower clashes with a stronger version of the same tusk using the exact same attack and matches And it. to do a little bit more inverse scaling for a second, we know Baron the Demon King is roughly around the same strength as Biru, the King of the Ants, when he fights at the Jeju Island with Sanjin Wu. Which is crazy when you consider how many characters in the series are stronger than that Biru. A good example is someone like Tom Sandre, who was able to push a way stronger version of the same Sanjin Wu. On top of that, you can probably say a character like the Shadow version of Igris and the Shadow version of Biru should be stronger as they both have the martial rank and are capable of attacking people like Monarchs, which is shown by Biru when he fights one. On top of that, the three dragons that we see in the Shadow Monarchs army should also be stronger than that, as Thomas Andre says either one of them could annihilate the whole human race, including himself. But that's not the only feat, we have another Tusk feat which happens towards the end of the series. Basically, we see Tusk and the Kamish Dragon Shadows having a fight over who can create the biggest fire blast. And basically, Tusk cheats by using the Orb of Avarice and launching a big attack in the sky which disperses all the clouds in the area. And normally, in general, cloud dispersion feats are always strong, but this one's especially strong for a very important reason. We learn towards the end of the series by Wu Jing Chol that the island that they are on that's owned by Sun Jin Wu is around tens of thousands of meters in size. And from there, we're able to get how much dispersion happened, the diameter, and then on top of that, we use a one second time frame based on a one panel usage. After all that math, we then apply the kinetic energy formula to give us a result of around 60 gigatons of TNT. Now sadly, there's only one shadow that I'm actually really 100% sure is stronger than this feat. Which happens to be Balion, who's the original Grand Marshal of the original Shadow Monarch army. This is for a few reasons, one of them being that he's a Grand Marshal, the highest rank within the Shadow Monarch system. And on top of that, when he fights Biru, he easily destroys him. Which brings me to the conclusion that the strongest shadow within the Shadow Monarch army happens to be Balion at island to large island level. But if I had to be honest, there's nothing compared to Sun Jin Wu himself, who is the strongest character the Shadow Monarch could ever imagine to be. Now first things first, to explain how strong Sun Jin Wu is, I first have to explain how strong the destruction monarch or the monarch of dragons is. When the dragon monarch originally fights Sun Jin Wu, we know Sun Jin Wu gets easily overpowered. We know the shadows don't work and the shadow monarch himself is getting destroyed over and over again when they fight. This is actually where we see the strongest feat in the series when we see the destruction monarch release an attack so strong that it creates a waterway that dwarfs the island around now, it. Now calculate this feat is pretty simple. I use the spoon the water from the island all the way to the blast radius when it explodes. With that I'm able to get the diameter and then on top of that the volume of it itself using the height. Then to a density of water I'm able to get a kinetic energy value with its speed being one second, one panel again. To give us an end result of around three teratons of TNT and to be more specific this is enough energy to destroy a small country. From there we see Sun Jin would become one with his darkness power to create a form that's able to match the Monarch of Dragon. But then he sadly runs out of power and loses to the Monarch of Dragon. But that was all the plan to get the rules to come here with the rulers there they're able to take the Monarch of Dragons out. Now if for some reason you're watching this without seeing the end of the series and what happens at the end after all this stuff happens. I'm here to give you a warning which is a spoiler warning for the post story. If you haven't read it click off or if you want to just keep watching. Now with that spoiler warning out of the way let's continue. At the end of the series using the mysterious cup Sun Jin Wu requested the rules reset all the time and turn it back to the start so Sun Jin Wu can kill everyone himself and stop everyone from getting hurt. This ultimate sacrifice is then granted and Sun Jin Wu goes back to when he's a teenager and defeats all the monarchs himself by going into the time rift and destroying We him. also do learn that he had a direct fight with the monarch of dragons where he does defeat him. So yeah, Sun Jin Wu is easily small country to country level. We also learn that Sun Jin Wu became immortal. We also know Sun Jin Wu does not fear the rulers as he seemingly shades them off and shades off their warning and requests with his own power and seemingly scares the delivery man. This is especially impressive when you take into account that the rulers did defeat defeat the monarchs originally. Which brings us to the end of AP. Now, of course, I'm going to go into the few debunks that people might try and bring up and the few things that people get wrong about the series. For one, this is a Marmor scale. This is talking directly about Sun Jin Wu within the Marmor, known the light novel, like clarifies in the description of the video itself. And of course, these two things are separate canons, separate things happen in the stories and they are slightly different between canons. On top of that, the statements about how the monarchs and rulers can destroy a planet are taken out of context. For one, what's actually stated is that Marnel's planet would not be able to survive a war between the monarchs and rulers. But to be fair, there's seemingly hundreds of rulers and on top of that, the monarchs have an army of 10 million. And on top of that, this is described as a long drawn out war. This isn't something that would be over in 10 minutes. So this is also an overtime. Thing. So I definitely don't think any of this leads to the idea that they'd be planning. On top of that, while the Dragon Monarch and Sunjin Wu are fighting, Wu Jin Chol implies that because they're on an island off the coast of Tokyo, the damage would be minimal to the surrounding area. Because the land itself is rich in mana, which makes kind of no sense unless you're trying to say that, that island's durability is more than that of a planet. And we do know for a fact that mana rich areas don't improve the durability of things that much, as a pickaxe is still able to break rock within a mana rich area like a dungeon. Especially A rated dungeons, which we see normal pickaxe is able to break rock. Now in terms of speed the conversation becomes a little weird because yes at the start of the series we do see a light magic user exist as a D-rank hunter. But for one we know this is a little weird because we know D-rank hunters are supposed to be especially weak. And on top of that the light kind of This curve. would also make especially no sense when you consider the fact that Baron the Demon King uses natural lightning from a cloud as an attack. And we know Baron the Demon King should be capable of taking down multiple S-rated hunters. But that doesn't mean that Sun Jin Wu isn't light speed. In the Architect's Double Dungeon we know that the head boss golem is called God. The reason why this is so important is because God is based on the absolute being. He even looks like the absolute being. And we do know the absolute beings leading men are the rulers, which are made from light. And
And to send this even further home, we know he has a laser beam which he releases from his eyes, which is also stated to be a laser and vaporizes the ground when it hits it, creating a large amount of heat. On top of that, it seemingly has no curve on it, which would meet two of the requirements needed to say it's like light. It does share properties of All it. All these things in combination give me the idea that the absolute being ripoff god golem should be actually shooting a real laser. And the way weaker Sun Jin Wu has a feat of dodging it, which I was able to calculate around 53% the speed of light. Sun Jin Wu then surpasses that and the architect itself in the system itself, which would make him even stronger than this golem and faster than this golem and make him easily FTL and then he gets far faster after that. Which brings us towards the end of this video. I'd like to thank you all for watching this video. I hope you are happy with the results. Remember this is a marble scale. I hope you all enjoy the new upcoming anime or solo leveling and tell me what you think of it in the comments below. Also remember to like and subscribe. I'm almost at a thousand subs.